It is a magnificent example of central planning. And it all began 800 years ago. I'm talking about the central axis of Beijing, the Chinese capital. The central axis, our reporter on the scene, is Amy Lyons. Amy, what exactly is the central axis? So the central axis is a line that runs from north to south. It's 7.8 kilometres in length. And basically all of the important buildings from ancient Beijing were built along this central axis. So if you want to explore traditional ancient Beijing, you really can't avoid this axis. The Forbidden City, for example, is built right in the middle of it. So whereabouts are you on the central axis? I'm currently at the northernmost point of the Beijing central axis. In, behind me here, I have the drum tower, and in front of me is the bell tower. It's two ancient buildings that have stood side by side for 800 years, and the function of this bell and drum tower is actually very interesting. Back in the day, these two towers functioned like an ancient alarm clock. In the morning, there'd be a bell from the bell tower in front of me here, and at night, there will be a drum from the drum tower. And it's said that the acoustics are so good from both of these towers, you could hear the bells and the drums for over 20 kilometers. Amy, how old are these two buildings? They share about 800 years of history. So they've been dominating the Beijing skyline for a very, very long time and were the tallest buildings in the area up until quite recently. Thanks, Amy. And high up there on the bell tower, we can see directly down the central axis. Well, it's down there. You take us to some visual splendor, a series of beautiful lakes. So we are in the scenic lakes area of Shichahai. It's made up of three lakes, Qianhai, Front Sea, Houhai, Back Sea, and Sihai, West Sea. And it's a beautiful place to come for a walk. You've got, you've got boats on the water, people taking romantic strolls with their partners. It's a great place to hang out. So Amy, it's beautiful, it's romantic. Oh, 100%. This is a very romantic place to take a stroll, whether that's in the day or the night. Actually, my favourite time to come here is at sunset. You've got beautiful sunset views over these lakes here. It's a very scenic area. You've got old bridges, you've got flowing rivers, you've got boats passing by as you're walking. It's extremely beautiful and probably one of my favourite places to go for a walk in Beijing. It's a beautiful place for a walk here, but in my opinion, the best way to get around and see the area and understand its history is to get on one of the famous rickshaw rides. You can't come to Beijing as a tourist without trying one of these. Hey, Chef Wu, hello. Hey, hello, how are you? Do you want to go? Yeah. Can you? Can you? Okay, we're going to get on the rickshaw and okay. we're going to go exploring. Please. A rickshaw ride will set you back around $65 for a ride. So yes, it is quite pricey, but it's a wonderful way to take in the splendours of the ancient city and see some historic sites along the way. Amy, you also go ice skating there. Oh, you betcha. I was ice skating here not two months ago. I live just around the corner from where I'm standing right now. And one of my favourite things to do on the weekend with friends would be to come here and ice skate. So next highlight on the central axis is Jingshan Park, which towers over the Forbidden City. There's Amy climbing to its summit. Amy, this is the high point that's distinctly man-made, not as nature originally laid down, eh? It isn't really real. If you've ever been to Beijing, you will know that Beijing is an incredibly flat city. There are pretty much no inclines to be found, except for right here. It is a fake hill, and it was actually built using the leftover earth piled up from constructing the moats around the Forbidden City. So it's about the same age as the Forbidden City itself. So exploring by foot is worthwhile. Yeah, the walk is beautiful. On the way, you pass by several beautiful pagodas. And actually, we're here at the perfect time because it is spring. And we've managed to capture the very small windows where all the flowers are in bloom. So you've got beautiful pink and white and yellow flowers everywhere you look. And it's absolutely gorgeous. From the top of Jingshan, you can see right along the central axis. So very deliberate, eh? 
It's very deliberate and you can see it so clearly from the top of Jingshan Park here. And actually when we get to the Forbidden City, it'll stop being this concept of a line and you'll actually see a tangible line that you can walk on and see with your own eyes. think of Beijing or Peking, we think of Beijing duck or Peking duck. But there is another delicacy that's taking Beijing by storm. It's the hot pot. Yes, so I am actually here at what is known as Beijing Instant Boiled Mutton Hot Pot. It's another extremely famous specialty of Beijing. And basically the concept is you grab a piece of mutton, you put it very quickly into this hot boiling water, and you just wait for it to change colour, then you dip it in your sauce, and then you put it in your mouth. It's, uh, it's delicious and it's much beloved by the Beijing people. Yeah, this hot pot actually has 800 years of history and it's very different from the other hot pots that you see in China, which maybe have a very spicy hot pot base or very flavorful hot pot base. But this base here is actually just water with a few pieces of ginger and um, some little ingredients added, but it is definitely not full of flavor. So that means that the mutton here is the real star of the show. Let's go first with a piece of this mutton. So we're going to put it in here and let's just see just how long it takes to change colour. You know what? That was three seconds, Greg. Three seconds and it's ready to go. <laughs> it's extremely finely cut, so it really doesn't need a long time before it's ready. Just put it in a few more seconds just in case. <laughs> We're going to dip it in our sauce, and this is a very special sauce, actually, one of the, the main special things about this hot pot. It's a sesame sauce. Basically, when you're going to eat this, you're going to get the taste of the mutton and the taste of the sesame sauce, and it's just going to be a wonderful flavour combination. So without further ado, let's dip this in our sauce and uh, get a nice taste. No, I don't want to put too much. <laughs> From the taste of the mutton hot pot, let's prepare to visit one of Beijing's forbidden treasures. So we've all heard about the Forbidden City, but just how forbidden is this city, Amy? <laughs> Well, not so forbidden now. It's actually open to the public and it has been for a while. They actually call it the Palace Museum. So it's an, pretty much an outdoor museum. You can walk around and experience history firsthand. Symbolism is indeed the Forbidden City's middle name. There are symbols everywhere here. For example, on the doors of the Forbidden City, you can see lots of door nails. And on each door, there are 81 door nails, nine rows of nine door nails. And the reason behind this number nine is that nine is the highest single number. So it was given to the emperor as his official number as a sign of supremacy. And another place you can see the repetition of this number nine at the Forbidden City are on the roof ridges. Any building used by the Emperor would have nine roof ridge animals, mystical animals sitting there. But the one behind me here, this building is the Hall of Supreme Harmony. This building actually has ten mystical animals sitting on the roof ridges. And the reason why is that this building was the most important and largest building in the Forbidden City. And it was here that the Emperor would exercise his imperial power. So on that note, symbolism, as I understand it, all the important buildings there in the Forbidden City are all built along the central axis. That's correct. Actually, behind me here, you can see the central axis. It is this tangible line running through the length of the Forbidden City and beyond. Actually, as we continue following the central axis after the Forbidden City, we will still see this line. The Forbidden City here is a great place to come and walk around, but it's also a great place to take photos. And actually, in my line of sight here, I would see at least 50 people taking photos. But not just any old photos, beautiful photos that a lot of effort goes into. People come here with their makeup done, they're wearing the most beautiful costumes. Some people even dress up as the Emperor himself. So if you're after some fun photos, I would definitely recommend the Forbidden City. You're going to need to, uh, you're going to need a coffee to uh, wind down here, uh, Amy. I think I will need a coffee, but luckily there's actually a very famous coffee shop just on the outskirts of the Forbidden City. Good for people who want to experience the Forbidden City but may not have enough time. It's a Forbidden City themed coffee shop and actually all of the drinks there are named after emperors or all Forbidden City themed drinks and snacks.
One of the most unusual things you'll find along the central axis are markets that specialise in selling crickets. Crickets? Crickets that are used for both sport and pleasure. It's actually a very long and ancient tradition of China to raise crickets as pets. And back in the old days, they were appreciated for their singing voices, for the chirping, much like a musical instrument. But about 400 years ago, they started fighting crickets. And up until today, it's still a very, very popular sport. So, Amy, this sounds quite bizarre. How on earth can you train or tame an insect like a cricket? So I was just told by Mr Zhao, who is a cricket enthusiast, he said that some crickets are very easy to look after and some of them are very hard to look after. If you're just looking for a cricket that's going to have a nice chirping voice, they're very low maintenance. Give it something to drink, something to eat, it's going to be okay. But if you want to fight your cricket and if you want your cricket to go well, it needs to go through quite intensive training, much like any other athlete. If you want to just get your ordinary cricket, you could pay 20, 30, 40 renminbi, you know, a couple of dollars, up to $10. But if you want a supreme fighter, you can be paying anything up to 10,000 or 20,000 renminbi, thousands and thousands of dollars. It's incredible. And when you consider that these crickets only have a lifespan of 100 days, now that's quite an investment. Amy, I understand crickets have been part of Chinese life for 1,500 years. Yes, an incredibly long history, since the Tang Dynasty actually. Back in those days, people valued the crickets for their singing and chirping ability. But about 400 years ago, the crickets started to be used for fighting. Uh, it turns out that crickets really like fighting. Something that I did learn today is that here in Beijing, they don't fight crickets to the death. The crickets do not die at the end. Sometimes they pass out, <laughs> but they stay healthy and fit while they're in the ring. a trip along the central axis with our reporter Amy Lyons. Yes, so we've been following the central axis southwards and it has brought us to Beijing's oldest and most famous shopping street. It's Tianmen Main Street and it has almost 600 years of history. After the outer city of Beijing was built some centuries later, this became the main thoroughfare linking the outer city and the inner city of Beijing. And as of course is the case with main thoroughfares, a lot of commerce and trade flourished in this area and it became the most important shopping street in the city. And the interesting thing is, till this day, it is still a shopping and commercial street. So it's a great place to walk around, buy some things, get some snacks. It's a, yeah, like good place for shopping. So today we're just going to be enjoying this street because there's so much to see and do here. Not only is it this main walking street, but there are a lot of little alleyways breaking off this main street with things to see and eat and do. There's actually a very famous ancient eating street just in front of us here. It's called Xian Yukol. And I want to take you there to try one of Beijing's most traditional snacks and also one of my favorite things to eat. Let's go check it out. Just off Tianmen Main Street, you'll come across Xian Yu Kou. It is a food street with hundreds of years of history, 600 years in fact, and it's the perfect place to get a taste of the old Beijing. And I'm here today to introduce to you one of my favorite Beijing street snacks. It's called Baodor. And here I encourage you to keep an open mind because Baodor actually is translated to exploding tripe. But don't worry, no actual explosions involved. It's basically just quick fried tripe and it's absolutely delicious. Let's go find a place where we can give it a go. Here we have our very jiggly plate of exploding tripe baodor. And the consistency we're going for is that of like raw cucumber, that crunchy kind of consistency. And we're gonna dip it into this fabulous sesame sauce. That's what gives this the amazing flavor. I'm gonna dip it in there, get a generous nice <laughs> bit of sesame sauce there, and then just pop it in. Mm. Mm. Perfect. Perfect consistency, got that crunch. It really just tastes like a crunchy noodle. So anyone who might think of the idea of eating this a little bit difficult, it's so delicious.
One of the highlights along the central axis is a performance of the Chinese opera. Now, Amy has been lucky enough to score an invite backstage ahead of an actual performance. So, Amy, Chinese opera still very big there in Beijing. That's right, Greg. There are so many different kinds of opera here in China, but today we're exploring all about Beijing opera, or Peking opera as it's often known. But I've learned that there are four main roles when it comes to Peking opera. We've got the male role, we've got the painted face male role, we have the female role, and we have the comedian role. So that is uh, the four main things that people behind me are rehearsing right now. So how much deeper can you go backstage? So we're about to watch a Peking opera performance and we're lucky enough to come into the dressing room beforehand to see how these actors are doing their makeup. Because makeup is a really important part of Peking opera. It is so detailed, full of colour and expression and we've actually got someone who's been doing their makeup for over 30 minutes and they're not even halfway done. We're also meeting up with one of the biggest stars of Peking Opera, actress Zhang Mai. I began to learn Peking Opera at the age of 12. So far, I've been learning it for 14 years. Wow, and how long do you need to be learning Peking Opera before you can perform in front of an audience? Oh, that's an interesting question. If you learn Peking Opera as an amateur, I think you can perform a short part on the stage in a year or two. But we are the Peking Opera performers, so if we want to show the certain level on the stage, I think it will take us at least 10 years. 10 years. Or more. And then for an opera lesson? Well, I'm interested to see if maybe I can learn something from you today. Yeah, sure. You can try Meng Tingde first. Okay. Then on with a live performance. So there are a lot of different operas in China that go back thousands of years. Peking opera is a relatively more recent style of opera. It came to be in around the mid Qing dynasty around 150 years ago. So compared to some other opera styles, it is more modern and it incorporates some of the other opera styles that already do exist in China. So you can kind of see it as a little bit more of a mesh of different opera styles into Peking opera. But some of the things that Peking opera is famous for is the incorporation of singing, dancing, reciting, and most excitingly, a lot of acrobatics and martial arts. It looks like a very vivacious style of opera. All right, Amy, it's been quite some journey there along the central axis. We've finally reached the end. And where exactly are you? Yes, so we have travelled along the central axis today and it has led us to the Temple of Heaven. It's not technically right on the central axis, it's just to the side of it, but it's a very important place here in Beijing because back in the day, the emperor, he would travel from the Forbidden City along the central axis out of the inner city to reach this point of the Temple of Heaven. And it's actually here at the Temple of Heaven where the emperor would pray for good harvests for the year to come. It's a series of temples and altars. This is more of a ritualistic centre of Beijing. So the emperor would actually conduct sacrifices here to the heavens. So it's called the Temple of Heaven. And actually, there's a lot of symbolism about heaven and earth. Actually, in the hall behind me here, it's called the Hall of Prayer of Good Harvest. You'll see a recurring motif of squares and circles, where the circle represents heaven and the square represents earth. <laughs> now, exercise, I'm told this is uh, the place to come and uh, go through uh, your exercise ritual. 
That's right. This Temple of Heaven here is also really famous for the exercise park situated on the park grounds. And you've got people coming here every day as early as 5 a.m. to exercise and to socialize. And what's really surprising about the majority of people who go to this exercise park is their retirees and the exercises they're doing. You will not believe it. So Amy, you've really educated us about the central axis. You wound up there at the Temple of Heaven, a heavenly experience all around, I think. Yes, it's been absolutely wonderful exploring the more traditional and ancient side of Beijing through the central axis today. Bye-bye.